You know, we all like to come on here and take liberties at the expense of the WWE's creative team, their creative processes, and understandably so, because a lot of times their product is hard to sit through. A lot of times their shows, from beginning to end, are hard to sit through. They feel like a chore in a lot of ways, and, you know, it seems like the WWE lacks a lot of creativity, a lot of originality, and frankly isn't putting forth the type of effort to put on a better show that maybe they should, you know, having more professional pride, whatever the case might be. But, you know, as I'm sitting there and I'm watching Raw this week, I'm just sitting there and thinking to myself, you know, shit, this is three hours. Every single stinking freaking week. How could anybody be successful in this type of format? How could any show be well written from beginning to end? How could any show be filled with spontaneousness and originality and creativity when you've got to write three hours of this shit every single week? Not to mention the other stuff that you have to write for. No wonder it sucks. You're talking about three hours having to fill each and every single Monday night live. They can't book this shit well, and they don't. And I know with three hours every single week, I most certainly wouldn't book this shit well. And I know most certainly you wouldn't be able to either. Now, I don't always like to blame the environment or the situation or the circumstances because I believe you can do better. I believe you can overcome it. I can believe you should be successful in spite of it. And I still maintain that to a degree. However, at some point in time, you have to be honest with yourself and say, shit, how could anybody be successful having to write for this crap? Three hours each and every single week. Three hours. That's 12 hours a month. And sometimes if there's five Raws in a month, that's 15 hours a show that you have to write. That's outrageous. And we know what it leads to. Burnout for the creative team. Imagine having to sit there and write all of this crap. And then on top of that, just to know that most of the time you're going to have to rewrite this shit at the last minute come Monday afternoon, if not Monday evening, if not Monday night during freaking Raw. Because Vince McMahon gets a whim and says everything sucks, so let's make it worse. you got to think that that's got to sit there and weigh on these guys when they're trying to put together a show and piece together a show and produce a show and write a show. What the hell good does it do to be original or creative? Because we've got all this shit that we got to fill. we got all this time that we're looking to take care of. And then we know that mostly any idea that we have that would be anything close to remotely good, if we sneeze or fart or blow our breath anywhere in the wrong area of Vince's general direction, the whole shit can be thrown away. So what the fuck does it matter? So what this leads to is a static format where the show has the same type of predictable feel because of having too much time to fill, so much of this is the same because you get that oh my god feeling. We've written these three segments and we've got, what, nine more segments to fill. So as a result, you just start plugging in time, filling in time, trying to get people some time, trying to sit there and get to this commercial break or set up to this. So, so much of everything is the freaking same. You know, as much as I come on here and talk about how Raw is such a chore to watch, because it is, and how bad the product is, because it is, how does it have any choice but to not be? How could anybody book this shit this as anything other than crappy, consistently? You know, for all of us to sit on the outside and look at it, we couldn't do any better. Frankly, nobody could do any fucking better. How the hell could they? There is no way on God's green earth. So what it leads you to is maybe one or two themes or stories that are actually advanced or developed throughout the course of the night. And then everything else kind of follows a pathetically predictable pattern of behavior. And the format pretty much feels exactly the same. And then at the end of that three hours, you just sit there and say, ah, what did I just watch? It's really hard to justify sitting there and watching this stuff three hours each and every single week. It's like I'm sure it's hard to justify having to write for three hours of this crap each and every single week. And it's just one of these things that, unfortunately, I do think I have to kind of adjust my standards a little bit because it is three hours now. It shouldn't have to be that way, and it should be better than what it is just because the situation and the environment and the circumstances aren't favorable to producing a good show doesn't give the WWE the right to not give us a good show. 
but they consistently go out there and not give us a good show. And that's unacceptable. You should be better. It doesn't have to be Star Spangled Awesome every week, but it needs to be better. There needs to be more effort. There needs to be so many different things that happen. But at the end of the day, who the fuck could blame anybody for putting together this shit? Because what the fuck does it matter? I mean, you look at the Divas match. You've got Naomi versus Brie. And while so many of the Give Divas a Chance believers are going to sit there and say, well, this is great because they gave it so much more time and there's a story. There's no fucking story. Paige won the number one contender's battle royal last week and she's nowhere to be fucking found. So now Naomi, who apparently has just turned heel, is now wrestling the heel sister of the heel champion. And the reason the Bellas are back together still have never been really fully explained. And now Naomi wins. And all the while, it's just Nikki Bella sitting there on commentary. You're building up to a match that has no purpose. You're building up to a match of really no consequence. You're building up to a match that, again, has no story following the same type of format. Similar to what you do with the number one contender's tag match. This is exactly what they did. It's the same shit. Instead of having the champions on commentary, you've got them watching backstage. A match that's just kind of thrown together and out there, and then you have the winner, and that's it. It's the same pattern. The Divas, it's the commentary crap. It seems like for the tag title match in a lot of ways, especially now without the Usos in the title picture, you know, the WWE really doesn't have any direction or any type of rudder in terms of what path they want to go on with that division because they don't have a path, because they don't have a vision, because they don't have a direction, because they have three hours of fucking show to fill every single week. So what does it really matter? It's just all going to blend in anyways. Now you look at Fandango versus Curtis Axel. What's the point of this? Just a couple of minutes or either one of these guys on the pay-per-view? As far as I know, no. This is your go-home show for Extreme Rules, so you would think that you would devote a good portion of that show to stuff that actually pertains to the pay-per-view itself. But again, you've got three hours to fill, so you, as a consequence, you're going to have to put on stuff on there that has absolutely nothing to do with the freaking pay-per-view. Same thing with Ryback versus Adam Rose. I mean, you're wasting Ryback's time with Adam Rose, and again, uh, do they have anything for Ryback at the pay-per-view? Is he going to be involved in the pay-per-view in any way? At this moment, I don't believe so, but again, because you have three hours to fill, because you have three hours to fill, you're going to have pointless filler crap like this every single week, no matter what. It shouldn't feel like that, but that's exactly what you have, because you have no choice. Like, you look at Sheamus versus Zack Ryder. At least this was an attempt to do something, but again... They're sitting there, the only time they ever bring out Zack Ryder is to fucking job him out. Now, this is a guy that had a sizable so social media following, still does, you know, and I never got why the WWE just wanted to sabotage him so fucking bad. And to idiots like Chris Jericho that apparently have decided to lick off Vince and the company's nutsack for whatever reason, for getting pride or integrity for the almighty dollar, you know, they intentionally sabotage guys all the time. Zack Ryder would be example A number one. You know, every time you see Zack Ryder, you know he's going to job. Every time you see Zack Ryder, he know, you know he's their go-to, going to get his ass kicked type of guy. They love fucking with this guy. And that's that simple. And it's Sheamus whopping on him all over the place. And now Dolph Ziggler comes out to make the save. At least there was an attempt to tell a little bit of a story here. But, you know, you haven't really established that Dolph Ziggler and Zack Ryder are friends on television. This would mean so much more if you actually took the time to have a little bit of depth of characters, a little bit of depth of story to put layers into your story. However, because you have to spread your resources so thin because you're looking at filling three hours a show, that attention to detail is sacrificed and it produces the mediocre shows that we get. Like with that three hours of time to fill, you give us The Miz versus Damian Sandow all fucking again. Again. Is this even a match on the pay-per-view? You've literally, I believe, had them wrestle every single week on Raw since WrestleMania 31. Wouldn't that be the type of story that you would wait until the next pay-per-view and maybe if you did one match to advance the story, that's so be it. But you've literally had them wrestle each and every single week. And this time, it's not any different because you've incorporated some array. Oh boy, we're going to put freaking Miz with another tall blonde. Whoopee! You know, you're telegraphing the whole thing. You know that Summer Rae is going to turn on Sandow the entire time. Miz isn't going to lose the right to use the Miz name. It just was pointless. And you've taken something that could have been really, really good and turned it into something that's just more filler crap. Because, again, you lose that attention to detail 
and you lose that desire to want to go above and beyond because you've got time to fill. So it doesn't matter. You just got to put it out there. And that's what you happen here, and you completely didn't negate having any point of having this match at a freaking pay-per-view, which is where it should have happened, where the blow-off should have occurred. You know, for some reason, they still don't figure out a way to feature the Intercontinental Champion Daniel Bryan. I don't care if they're trying to sit there and say that he's going to be injured and he's not going to wrestle in the WWE. Made sure the commentators wait to great lengths to talk about the fact if it's going to happen, him and Barrett Sunday at the pay-per-view. But an entire three-hour show, you can't find a way to feature Daniel Bryan in some way, shape, or form. You can't have an interview with him. You can't have some type of backstage segment. You can't bring him out for a segment. You can't have him sit there and get involved in some way, some form of distraction in a Wade Barrett match. You just do nothing. Again, it's that burnout. It's having that too much time to fill where everything is the same. And because you've got John Cena as the U.S. champion, you don't want to sit there and have the IC champion get the equal shine. And that's it, period. You know, and even Dolph Ziggler versus Seth Rollins. You know, it's funny that so often when it's certain guys, especially a guy like Randy Orton or John Cena, they'll have interference in this shit and that shit, but it'll either occur after the match or if it occurs during the match, Cena or Orton will still freaking win. But you know, in this particular case here, Ziggler versus Seth Rollins, you know Ziggler ain't winning, especially once Sheamus gets involved in this dragon. At least, again, there was an attempt to tell a story here, but it could have been so much more. And that's the problem, is when you have three hours to fill, the show could be so much more. And the three big things of the night that I'd come away with, we're talking about tough enough. Why are we making a big deal about fucking tough enough? I know the company thinks that this is something good. This is more content for them. Da, da, da. They can talk about how awesome they're all, all this other crap. But when you look at tough enough, what tough enough winner has ever really frankly done any fucking thing in the WWE? And I mean that truly seriously. You'll give me one option, maybe two. I mean, but if you want to pay attention to Tough Enough and anybody to really look out for, look at the ones that don't end up fucking winning. They're the ones that seem to have the most staying power. So doesn't that show you how stupid your fucking Tough Enough show is and how stupid the Tough Enough process is? And the fact that they use Triple H's first pro WrestleMania appearance to pump this up is just bad. And again, again, shows that this company is desperate to fill three hours of time. This did not need a multi-minute segment, especially if none of the participants from Tough Enough have even been decided yet. It did not need several minutes of a promo segment devoted to it, even though, praise God, God needs it. Then you get to Cena's open challenge. This is the same shit every week, and it's going to be repetitive and the same shit every week. While you're going to think it's great that the U.S. champion is defending his belt each and every single week, at the end of the day, every week, it's going to be the same result. LOL, Cena wins. And now we went back to Kane and John Cena for the umpteenth dozen time. And why in the hell is John Cena concerned about Kane in any way, shape, or form? When has Kane ever fucking beat you? When is the last time Kane was ever even really a threat or an opponent for you to take serious? But yet when Kane's music hits, all of a sudden, magically, it's a big fucking deal and Cena's scared. LOL, Cena wins. Get the fuck out of here. With this whole open challenge thing, all the while, we seem to have forgotten that he's facing Rusev Sunday at the pay-per-view. And we're so focused on featuring John Cena in the U.S. champion that we've forgotten to advance the story between him and Rusev, frankly, in any single way whatsoever. And you can't really say that they have, regardless of what you want to say about Rusev running out of this or that, because they don't feature Rusev on TV. And they've barely done it since WrestleMania. But then we get to the big story of the night, which is Randy Orton and Kane. And this is always the problem, it seems like, for the WWE, is that with all this time to fill and kind of getting that static format is they tend to rely on the same guys because they're reliable, because they're predictable, because they're somewhat dependable, and they can do what they need to do, and they do the job that they're supposed to do. And that's understandable. You know, I did think Randy Orton was really good on this night. I thought his promo was about the best at the beginning of the show that you could expect out of Randy Orton. I loved the concept, as you know, of him going wild buck crazy and just fucking RKOing people all over the place. I'd have done it more. I'd have done it throughout the entire fucking night. Just randomly, you know, put plants in the crowd. Have them fucking RKO fans. RKO Vince. RKO Kevin Dunn. But God, please. That would be sports entertainment. You know, I love what they did with Randy Orton, but so much of the story, again, of this show was devoted to Kane. What is it about this company and their ever-loving chubber for Kane? Kane! Kane! 
Are you building up to him and Seth Rollins in a one-on-one -on -one feud for that fucking title? Oh, good God, please don't. Are you building up to a triple threat at some point with him and Seth Rollins and maybe Randy Orton? No, please, again, good God, don't. Why this company, again, thinks it's such a good idea to make Kane such an integral part of the story defies any type of logic that I can wrap my fingers around. It just absolutely does. This whole guardian of the gate thing. Well, what the fuck does it matter? It's a steel cage with an open top. If you run two or three people out there to distract Kane, somebody can still climb over the fucking top. Just so many things about this show are so ridiculous. And the fact that we are here after almost 20 years now of this guy and he is still being featured as one of the most important things of the show. Kane got way more camera time than your IC champion Daniel Bryan. Injury or not, no excuse. He got way more mic time than a Dean Ambrose who took second fiddle in the microphone department to freaking Luke Harper of all people. One of the best talkers you've got. Whose easiest path to getting over is on the fucking microphone and you don't put him on the microphone. Why? Because we need Kane to talk several times throughout the freaking night. I'd rather they make J&J &J security a bigger part of the story. Fuck it, at this point in time, I want J&J &J security to win the tag team titles. Yeah! Just like Edge had the belt and you had Ryder and Hawkins, why the fuck can't you do it with J&J &J security? That would be at least a little something to help me get through the three-hour suck fest that is raw pretty much each and every single week. Well, tell me these matches are good, because most of them are repetitive. Most of them aren't that fucking good. It's just the fact that you need something to help you get through. And frankly, the only thing you got as a WWE fan nowadays is the match quality, which is sometimes suspect at best. The storytelling is terrible. The character development, in large part, is horrible. And the decision-making is atrocious. Atrocious. Heading into your first pay-per-view post-WrestleMania, you're featuring a guy in Kane more prominently than 99% of your fucking roster. You're making Kane a bigger part of the story than your world champion, Seth Rollins. But again, I can't blame the people involved with the WWE. Because what the fuck else would I expect? They've got to fill three hours of TV time each and every single week. And the fact that they're even able to scrounge up this crap is a pleasant surprise to me. This is bad. This is really bad. And you damn good and well know this shit is bad. And it's not going to get any better. And frankly, you can't really expect it to get any better. And why should it get any better? Because it's not going to.